Well, good morning and a warm namaste from New Delhi, India. I can't I hear you. Good evening from uh, uh, wherever you are in case it's early morning or evening. We are going to be discussing uh, the status of world trade. Uh, Mr. Aga is joining us from Geneva. Mr. Siddharthnath Singh is minister uh, from Uttar Pradesh, the largest state in India. And Lisa is joining us from Sydney. Uh, we have a couple of more speakers, but as soon as they join, we'll bring them in. But uh, Mr. Uh, Singh is here. I'd like to begin by inviting him to talk about this. I think the key issues that we've been facing was that multilateral trade systems were in decline uh, even in the years before this. Uh, and the two recent developments of COVID and, of course, the aggression that has been seen from China and the uh, uh, Wuhan virus uh, challenges have also led to a lot of rebalancing of uh, trade globally. What does this mean for business leaders, for trade professionals, for emerging economies, as well as uh, the established uh, developed economies? I think that's a key question to address. I'm going to now begin by inviting uh, Minister Siddharth Nath Singh, uh, who leads the trade and export and investment. <coughs> for uh, the state of Uttar Pradesh. Minister Singh, may I request you to share your thoughts on how you see for not just your state, but also from the perspective of India? Well, uh, uh, thank you, Pranilja. Uh, and uh, I'm grateful uh, to Harassus for giving, me, uh, giving us this opportunity and to represent uh, Uttar Pradesh as a state, which is the largest state of uh, India. And uh, we have a population sometimes... Uh, our population is larger than, uh, well, it's said that we are larger than the ger combined Germany, France, Spain, Italy, all put together. So we have about 240 million people. Uh, but uh, yes, I think that today's topic is the collapse of regeneration of the world trade, which is a multilateral trade decline. Uh, post, uh, well, we will talk about the pre-COVID, certainly. we did see that there were issues where bilateral trade was coming into a focus more and more globally. And uh, that was in particular, it was taking shape because of certain imbalances in the economic power, which was spread throughout the world. And uh, one of the uh, I would say the negativity of the fight against COVID has been that uh, because of the multilateral trade system, uh, that uh, we could not uh, actually uh, keep a sustainable uh, supply chain in order. So what we really s saw was a huge disturbance in the global supply chain. And that went across and certainly the disturbance came from one particular country and that country actually dominated the uh, global supply chain. So not only India, but we saw countries like USA, we saw countries uh, in Europe suffering from there, a country from Pacific uh, Ocean also suffering. So there was a, a feeling which came out of it that yes, it is important to have a multilateral trade system. And certainly... Can anybody can hear me? I think Mr. Aga is back on... Uh, so, I don't know whether Mr. Aga is hearing us, but uh, maybe... Mr. Aga, can you hear us? I don't think he is, but maybe somebody at your end or the monitor administrator has muted him. May may have to... Look at from that no, angle. No, uh, we can hear him, but he can't. But I'm requesting the uh, team uh, of Horasis to uh, to support. Uh, meanwhile, Lesser, please carry on. Okay, thank you very much. So now, in this background, I would uh, say that UP, we, our chief minister, our prime minister, we decided yes, there is a crisis. We need to convert this crisis into opportunity. And only those who look at opportunity will be in a position to su su uh, uh, survive. And therefore, we started, uh, certainly we did not uh, overlook or uh, we did not uh, ignore this, uh, the health issue. And certainly I would, I'm happy to say as a minister 
that Uttar Pradesh within India, being a large population, even if I compare with the European and many other uh, world, uh, you know, leaders or the big countries of the world, UP has performed much better. Our uh, death rate and our, or I would say, a recovery rate, both are very strong in India. So, or and Uttar Pradesh. So, from there we said, okay, how do we make this into an opportunity? The challenge was that uh, UP had to, uh, you know, uh, increase their SMEs or focus more on the SMEs. So we decided, and there was a package which was given by the uh, Prime Minister called At Nirbhar Bharat, uh, and under that. We said, okay, our SMEs will become strong. And to, to give one example, in this COVID period, in last three and a half months, UP has created fresh SMEs, which are in the order of 750,000 of them. These are new units, and we have distributed over $3.5 billion of fresh loans to them. So... We are creating in UP uh, employment for them. And this has been only possible because of active government and active participation of the community, explaining them, making our uh, laws uh, more uh, flexible. In fact, in UP, if you want to put up a MSME unit, you will be given a license in 72 hours. And in that 72 hours, you will be in a position to start your own factory. Many other, uh, uh, you know, reforms we have brought in, which is like labor. And uh, along with that, along with that, we have been able to introduce many other reforms in the electronic sectors and other sectors. And that has resulted in uh, last three months, we have focused with certain big countries like Germany, UK, France, Israel, USA, many other countries in Southeast Asia like Thailand, Japan, Korea. And I'm happy to say in last three months, UP, during the COVID, we have received proposals for, for investment, active proposal for $1 billion from 55 uh, investors. So these are good signs if you want to convert a crisis into an opportunity. And we do know that uh, there is a disturb, you know, global supply chain dis being disturbed. And in that global supply chain, we have focused that UP, wherever we have our uh, presence in the global supply chain, maybe even marginal, we can improve because there, the market which China was enjoying is also losing. So that is the right place where UP can enter. And we are, we have introduced a more aggressive export policy. So there are certain advantages which you can create. And, uh, I would say that, uh, this is also, this is possible because we have not focused on bilateral trade alone. And there are a number of FTAs. I'm not against FTA. I'm not against bilateral trade, but certainly a, a global order or multilateral approach, which perhaps the WTO should be more aggressively leading rather than leaving with certain uh, countries just to uh, engage with each other and leave it. That should be a more aggressive approach by WTO to bring a balance in the global trade scenario. That's my own personal I wouldn't say it is the government of India's viewpoint, but yes, it is my viewpoint. And we all can take advantage, particularly the developing nations will stand to an advantage. Otherwise, those who are economic powers can certainly they have uh, advantages of uh, economies and they can um, uh, disturb the balance. I would always request when we are creating a global trade scenario, we, the developing countries have cheap labor, we can produce goods, we can produce excellent quality of goods, quality will cannot be compromised, but in that, the 
those economies which are developed they should support and they should come up with better innovations which they can do they have a better r&d they have better technology they can support the developing countries through their technologies their innovations and certainly that would help in creating an environment where imbalances in future if we all have to face a pandemic like this situation then imbalances in global supply chain do not happen so i will uh, respect myself here because time is of essence and uh, like pranjeet had already said the few uh, you know uh, i think 6 or 7 minutes would be given to each speaker i leave it here i'm sure this is my opening remark i'll get an opportunity to speak further thank you very much uh, thank you mr thank singh you. for those thoughts i'm going to request uh, lisa I have a colleague to to come in now. She is the chief executive officer of Global Trade Professionals Alliance uh, from Australia. Uh, Lisa, you know, all, not just from a Australian perspective, but also as trade professionals, uh, how do you see the situation? Because we haven't seen a lot of uh, positivity so far. Uh, the dominance of the global economic power is on is on decline. The the center of gravity is shifting to Asia, uh, and I think Australia is part of that shift. Uh, so how do you see the situation emerging <clears throat> thank you thank you very much and also thank you very much to harassis for the invitation to participate um in this digital breakfast session well for those that are in europe for me it's the uh, afternoon uh and welcome everybody um uh, firstly i hope you and your families are well uh despite can you hear me difficult times yes mr aga we can hear you can you hear us the video is on um uh, you know it's being interrupted but uh, i think he's still struggling okay, please continue please sir okay so sure. now i i guess all of us are uh, adapting to the time that we do in so many different platforms that we have never used before um sure. so um i mean it's been almost 7 months in the world of online Nineteen uh, pandemic, and so much has happened to us. Um, just in the past six weeks, more than one million deaths that have been reported globally, and thousands of small businesses and sole traders have closed their doors. Global supply chains have reconfigured. Consumers have changed their behaviours, and governments have had to pour money into their economies to contain the pandemic. and mitigate hmm? the collapse. Mm, I can see them but no sound. Yeah, <laughs> no, they are using their, they have their own platform. Something wrong is it wrong the world, wrong the world. So I don't need to No, do once you get to No, you get to Google email and then I can. Did you like to put on I think you should do a new button you still not on mute. Mr. Aga please be on mute if you can hear us. Sorry about this Lisa I really don't know how to control it. I have sent an email to the Horasis team to address it but uh, haven't got a response. It's okay I have one of my fellow colleagues from Canada online and we had some issues like this that we organized in April bridge as well we were mad and behind the scenes dealing with technology issues. Really? <laughs> um so um all of the tips are some tips about how the world of trade might look in a few years however in this short period of time we must also have the humility to recognize that it is too early to have all the answers about the impact of the covid-19 pandemic on the fundamentals of global trade we can find to Well, they're using uh, Google this thing about how global trade will perform once the COVID pandemic is mostly controlled or overcome. Yet, doing so without looking at the state of global trade before the pandemic is a futile exercise. While the pandemic created some transformation of its own, most changes and disruptions that have uh, occurred. can be linked to existing inequalities lack of international cooperation absence of political leadership and nationalistic interests at the core of the global trade system 
with a more inclusive code system that properly supports SMEs, women, and rural communities, as well as a modern and um, resolute world trade organization and a trade system based on economic complementarities, innovation, and the expansion of global values, rather than the weaponization of trade. Then the international community would have been more prepared, I think, to deal with the pandemic. But sadly, the case are trying to really sell a boat through a major storm, whilst at the same time having to look at rebuild it. All the pending tasks to make the world of trade stronger and more resilient are haunting us under the most difficult circumstances. The lack of inclusive trade has uh, triggered a backlash against globalization and it has fed protectionist sentiments. And the stalemates at the WTO have led to a more fragmented and polarized world that could hinder economic growth. The weaponization of trade, on the other hand, is hurting all countries. And uh, you alluded to being here in Australia, and we are in the middle of that situation here at the moment. Yeah. But it is hurting all countries. Given the connected the nature of trade, none of us have agreed from what is happening. And we talk of this trade war between two nations when in reality it affects all nations. Improving the world trade is the responsibility of all actors in, involved. Well, at the private level, we at the Global Trade Professionals Alliance have a series of ongoing initiatives on inclusive trade. And we're currently working on a worldwide project on building a solution to look at integrity and global value chains. These people are crazy. Being supported by. I'm not logged in with her email. Region. So they are now sending the verification it's code to me. It's not to my phone, it's to the coalition of people globally with the Bloomberg on how to come out in building global resilience and supply chains across the region. So to conclude, the world's trade recovery post-COVID is going to require innovative ways of thinking, but so does restoring and transforming its fundamentals. And this is where the role of reforming the WTO under new leadership will be absolutely vital. We have known for a while how to do that. We just now have to, to, to actually do it. Uh, so thank you. I'll uh, hand over my time now. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I'm coming back to uh, Minister Singh uh, on, on this point, uh, especially when you talk about weaponization of trade. And uh, uh, Mr. Singh, uh, my request to you is also to talk about the fact that, you know, we have seen how trade is being used as a weapon in many ways. And now India is also now uh, standing up to this. And we are talking about self-reliance in Hindi, which means Aapsan Nirbharta which means that we, we make sure that we develop our own capabilities and reduce unnecessary uh, reliance on uh, countries and perhaps companies which are not, uh, do not have a country's in, uh, interest, uh, best interests in mind. Uh, can you help us understand, uh, you know, what, what you think emerging economies and India, the path of self-reliance, how critical will this be in the global trade situation? In the meanwhile, well, uh, I'm also going to reach out to Mr. Aga's office and come back. Uh, I'll, I'll put myself on mute, but Mr. Singh, please start. Uh, well, Pranjay, if you recall that uh, a decade or two decades back, uh, the global order for trade was basically that, uh, well, if I can buy a cheaper product from a, a country, and for that we had, and then those economies which were stronger economies, the trade pact was being made under FTAs where uh, there was an insistence of duty reduction and that is how it existed. If I talk in the sense, in uh, purely in the sense of India, uh, we also had with many countries and it certainly benefited India. I will not say it did not benefit India. It did benefit India also. But uh, in current scenario, perhaps that uh, 
has changed but it has also come to as an uh, uh, i would say an economic asset because many the country with with whom uh, well the neighboring country where we are having a, a problem as of today and that is china where uh, uh, we have been able to leverage our economic strength because they had uh, their investments or their uh, you know products coming in so in the national interest it has come to an as an advantage so it is an advantage but there, therefore it is uh, i would say post covid we all need to look at uh, more of uh, imbalances to be taken away balance in trade to be brought so that economies can grow uh, together and each other strength needs to be added to the economic growth if we leave that each other strength and say no i will only grow the other cannot grow and we will then uh, supply or dominate the global order i think it is a dangerous sign because uh, for peace and for prosperity it is important that economic balances are maintained and those who are weaker economies they are strengthened and that goes down the ladder that's my opinion that's a very good thought uh, i'd request lisa to respond to this lisa because this is an important piece um, how do you ensure that the growth is equitable because covid is also an inflection point and we've talked about inequality is rising that the fact that globalization has benefited only a few people uh, so perhaps can this be a point where countries can focus on working together for a more equitable growth you do not say that one country will grow at the cost of other well i do believe that um what has happened throughout all of this is a lot of things have been laid bare as a result of the covid-19 pandemic um in terms of we have had um i would say a series of crises hit all at the same time in in one period uh we've had a climate crisis um in several parts of the world and i being in a part of the world that was very affected by that at the beginning of the year um we've had a climate crisis we have a health crisis and we have an economic and social crisis uh, and they are all four of these are colliding at once but i think they have also exposed a lot of inequalities that um were already there um and so i think this gives um a lot of um a lot of us that work in trade uh in government um and and in policy making roles be it private or the industry sectors um a chance to really look at how we do create the rules and the regulatory environment to foster more inclusive trade so and by inclusivity i'm talking about we have so, to- if i could if i could request you to pause i call mr aga's office uh, mr aga please speak yes he can speak now mr aga can speak now I can see him but he can't hear me can you request him to speak now he can make his statement right now thank you we are trying to our best in the situation i have informed his assistant uh, she is just asking him to start his uh, statement he'll make a statement and then be on mute and we can continue we have ten minutes left then Um, come on.
No, please request him to speak. But this, this, this is just strange. We can hear him. Yes, Hannah. I can okay. I can just go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, uh, good morning, all honourable minister, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is quite a very strange experience for me. But uh, we live in a strange world now with all kinds of things uh, happening. Uh, I was asked to address uh, two questions. I don't know if I could just do all of them at a time, since I'm not hearing you. Uh, but I can try and do the first one, which relates to the steps that need to be taken by developing countries uh, to achieve or ensure uh, sustained trade uh, recovery or rege regeneration of world trade. Um, uh, conceptually, I want to think that this has two perspectives. Whether you want to recover from trade or you want to regenerate your trade back to the level that you were before the pandemic or the perspective is to look beyond the pandemic and beyond the pre-pandemic uh, levels in terms of your resilience, economic resilience, and, and uh, growth and development agenda. So I, I think uh, this will depend on the perspective of the country. Since this pandemic is both a health and economic crisis, any recovery of trade would first depend on successfully addressing the health challenges. So if you just want to focus on getting back to the status quo before the pandemic, this could be done, maybe uh, based on estimates by the WTO, this could be achievable in, uh, by the end of 2021. However, like I said, this would be contingent on the kinds of policy measures you take, on whether the pandemic itself has uh, been fully addressed, and some of the sanitary measures that have been put in place have also been re relaxed. On the other hand, uh, w whatever you want to do for developing countries, and in particular uh, LDCs and small island states, the real challenge is the fiscal policy space. Many of these countries lack the resources to support uh, businesses, uh, households, to ameliorate the negative effect of the pandemic. So that is, they cannot react in terms of policy intervention the way most of the major economies are rolling out uh, billions and trillions of dollars of uh, uh, support programs. On the other hand, what has become clear from this uh, pandemic is the fact that many countries have now, or the pandemic has forced everybody online. So many countries have now come to appreciate the interface between trade and the digital economy. For some of them, this has produced a new experience, both in terms of the kinds of infrastructure that is needed to support online trade or the regulatory environment 
that they may need to put in place. So for some of these countries, uh, their SMEs have been able to use electronic commerce uh, to expand their trade and markets and much faster. So this has both turned into an opportunity. And going forward, I think a lot will now depend on how countries begin to rethink their growth strategies. In some ways, the pandemic has disrupted global value chains. So for many countries that had very narrow export, uh, export uh, categories of products, they, it is now an opportunity to begin to rethink in terms of diversification. For some, diversification is not just a matter of the composition of their trade. It could also be a rethinking of the networks, supply networks of trading partners. Because if you were relying on a partner that is very far away from you, you will now realize that a regional value chain may be more useful to you. And this is the reality because global value chains are essentially regional chains. If you see the experience in Asia, North America and Europe. So for countries like Africa, the new uh, continental free trade agreement uh, becomes a very, very, very important tool to uh, help them uh, diversify and expand the, uh, their participation in uh, global value chains. At the WTO, we are looking at not just the opportunities that arise, but we are also providing members with the opportunity to appreciate the kinds of measures that trading partners are putting in place. So there's this issue of transparency. As people begin to notify measures that they're putting in place and experiences are being shared, least developed countries in particular will begin to look at how they can also begin to reconfigure their trading patterns. Because it's not just enough to be working to, to trade, it's also to know what people are doing and how this will uh, affect you. So some of the cross-border measures that have actually closed down economies become critical in how uh, you recover. And, and at this point, I think one of the key issues is the recognition that members need to coordinate. No country in the current environment is going to recover on its own. So international cooperation, uh, multilateral, multilateral approaches become very important, even though we, we have a current environment of uh, trade tensions, geopolitical tensions, but it means everybody has to come together, both in the search for solutions to the pandemic ex itself and in the, uh, the economic perspectives that people would need to take. So co coordination among countries, cooperation among trading partners should therefore create mutually reinforcing benefits that will mean more revenues, more foreign exchange earnings that um, all members can then use to successfully recover and ensure economic resilience that can then put them on a growth path for future generations. So if you are just looking at trying to get back to where you were before the pandemic, uh, it's easier than if you are now thinking of going forward because you have now seen the opportunity to even for LDCs address the digital divide. If you cannot have uh, internet for connectivity, definitely you cannot participate in the emerging uh, digital uh, economy. So maybe uh, I can try to take uh, the second question. Uh, I think that's that fine. Okay we are running out of time, uh, Mr. Is Aga. that okay? Uh, 
No, no, because uh, we we Can don't. Can I try the second time. question too? Uh, not not yet, but okay, I so see. I Robert think has joined. The second question uh, was <laughs> really how we can look to revive uh, services trade. Uh, to benefit businesses and consumers in a post-COVID-19 world. And this is taking into account that uh, the trade impact uh, has created a lot of constraints on cross-border mo mobility. And I think uh, from here, the experience for us in the WTO is the fact that the services sector has been the most hit of uh, many of these, uh, uh, in, in many of our developing country economies. And here I'm talking of, there are members like the small island states who rely on almost 40% of their GDP depends on tourism services. So when you don't travel, when you don't receive uh, visitors because of the pandemic, when airlines no longer fly for these uh, countries, for those in the hotel and catering industry, I mean, you can Robert, imagine can you the impact. Me? And these countries, okay, uh, the small Mr. island Adam, states, also have limited stop, population. So, can't hear us. so they can't uh, even engage in any domestic you for your uh, quick reconfiguration of travel and business. If you, you are countries that are, have high populations, you could now put uh, put in place measures that encourage domestic tourism. But in this case, the populations are limited, so their chances to grow are also limited. There is also another set of countries within the uh, WTO, or maybe around the world, who have become, become so dependent on... Uh, uh, the, whatever the, their expatriates abroad sent back. So for those kinds of countries, this has come to, it's estimated that the, the GDP contribution is almost about 5%. So once uh, the repatriation of, of uh, resources becomes difficult, then they are also in trouble. And what we have seen the members doing is creation of mutual arrangements, some kind of green corridors that allow pre-testing before boarding and reduction in lockdowns. So two countries at, uh, at the same level of infection or at lower levels of infection creates some mutually uh, recognition arrangements and regulations that then allow people to travel. And I think the success of how we quickly recover for a sector like tourism would depend on how quickly these kinds of arrangements that create these bubble effects around the world uh, become faster. And I think uh, what you see in the WTO is the fact that most of the members and groups of members are already calling on, them, on the international community, on their partners to begin to come together. So if you go to the WTO website, you will see statements from the ASEAN, from the Keynes group, from African group, from the LDC group, from the ACP group. This shows that the whole membership has recognized that acting together, working together, will help them address some of the trade challenges, some of the food security cha challenges, some of the health challenges that they need to overcome in a post-COVID-19 uh, economy. My hope also is that members can begin to see developing countries in particular can begin to turn the pandemic from a challenge into an opportunity for investment. So you can now begin to look at different sectors 
you can now begin to look at challenges that you may have faced in global value chains, particularly for LDCs like Bangladesh, who have been very high heat in the garment and uh, clothing sectors of their economy. So all this is not a one size fits all, but I believe if everybody, every member of the WTO looks at the flexibilities in the agreements, for instance, some of the clauses in the International Te Telecommunications Agreement, you can then begin to see the opportunities where you will source cheap uh, technology products that can help you diversify and recover from the pandemic and then build the kind of uh, economic resilience that then insulates you from over exposure to external shocks. Uh, you are not listening to me, but maybe I think I should stop at this stage. Or well, I'm not hearing you, but I should stop at this stage. Can't hear you. Are you on mute? You're on mute. Are you able to hear me, Robert? Okay. Yes. So, Robert, since you joined last... Uh, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll ask you to speak for two or three minutes, giving a perspective from Germany. Uh, Minister Singh, thank you for your patience. And Lisa, thank you for your patience. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I think we can just extend by a couple of minutes to uh, allow Robert to make his uh, point, and especially uh, from, from an industrial giant of Europe. And uh, then we'll have to end because we're way beyond our time. Robert, uh, please go ahead. Uh, Pralje, I have yes. to address a press conference. So that was slated for Indian time, 11.30. So right, I understand, sir. So please, be, you may leave, sir. Please, thank you very much for joining oh, us. Sorry, Robert. Uh, sorry, sorry, Robert. But, uh, that's how my time was scheduled. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Good day. Good day. Thank you. So um, I regret that um, uh, I had some technical difficulties to enter the system. Um, however, that happened but um, anyway so i'm sorry to be a little late um and um i did not properly follow um the whole um, discussion because i um, intensely tried to enter the system and that took me some minutes or seconds to uh, to get there um uh, so um as i do not know what has been mentioned or talked about in detail let me at least say a few words about um uh, the relevance of um, international trade for germany um you probably have in mind the numbers and uh, uh, foreign trade quota set um, uh, for Germany, if not, um, we have a foreign trade quota of more than 70%. So Germany is heavily depending on international trade. Um, um, the success of the German economy is heavily depending on international trade. Um, uh, and um, not only the pandemic situation of uh, COVID, also um, uh, the um, current situation of of the crisis of the WTO as well as um, uh, other uh, protection protectionism um, measures of different nations are influencing our international situation um, the economy um, the small medium-sized backbone of the company small and medium-sized companies that are the backbone of the German economy are uh, trying to internationally trade their products. Um, uh, we have a, s a similar amount of imports and exports. Yes, we have a, an export surplus, but um, uh, in comparison to other nations, um, our import is um, uh, heavily depending on um, a, a, a rules-based uh, trade situation um, uh, that gives us the opportunity to properly um, uh, trade uh, with different nations globally. Um, I see or we see um, uh, the, um, the future situation um, uh, as being even more globalized um, uh, on different levels because of um, uh, Corona. Um, we see that um, certain dependencies on only a um, few suppliers in few nations is not um, uh, giving the strengths to the companies um, that they need. So they need more diversified suppliers um, in more diversified nations. 
So um, we see even more international trade, um, not less. Um, yes, we always speak in Europe, maybe also in other nations, about reshoring and or nearshoring. Um, things like um, having your supplier a little closer to your market. But um, if I say market, you have the other way around. Uh, you have to supply a market in a foreign market. So um, uh, diversification is even um, getting broader. Um, uh, so the dependence on uh, uh, rules-based trade um, uh, agreements um uh, it's um, heavy. Um, so uh, Germany and Europe uh, has is having uh, or is planning to uh, enforce international trade to further trade agreements. Um, uh, and um, even though they might be bilateral, um, uh, but uh, there are um, new upcoming um, multilateral trade agreements um, from Australia, for example. Um, uh, uh, so this is very much important for international trade. Um, and we support as Germany, German government and European governments um, are supporting trade agreements um, as we know that we are um, depending on international trade. Yes, the German economy, even more than other nations in Europe, um, uh, most of the trade that we have is within Europe. Um, but we have a tremendous um, uh, uh, interaction with China, um, uh, 100 trillion uh, euros trade in both directions. So it's in, then in, in altogether it's 200 trillion um, euros. Um, so there you see the relevance of um, international markets, China in this case. Um, we uh, again see uh, a further div diversification um, and not to be that much dependent on a single market. Uh, having in mind that we have global, um, let's say, interactions between different nations um, that influence um, uh, the um, accessibility of um, the different markets. So this is a very, very brief um, um, word from my perspective. I'm very sorry to be a little late. Um, no problem, Robert. So, you know, uh, Louis, uh, Lisa has been extremely patient. Lisa, a closing comment from you and then we will end. Oh, uh, no, no, no. no, no very interested in what you're saying, Robert. Uh, I'd like to continue a conversation offline with you because we're doing a lot of work on the importance of how actually the opportunities out of all of this is, as you say, the need to get wider diversification of SMEs into supply chains. Um, and we, we're very interested in what you're doing on that. And I'd love to chat with you further on it. Um, um, and particularly also because we're, we're in a little similar situation in terms of being caught between what else is going on in the world, um, but having two very important kind of um, uh, countries that we trade with. So, yeah, love to chat with you. <laughs> thank yeah. you, Lisa, and Sounds thank good. you, Robert. And uh, I hope all of you who watched this session uh, found it useful, uh, despite all the technical challenges we faced. And once again, uh, wish you a great day or a great evening, as it were. Uh, and I hope you'll join the rest of Horaces. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Panja. Bye-bye.